You know, I wore these glasses to try to look like a history professor, but it's pretty clear now that I'm seeing them on video that they're blue light. So I guess that just makes me look like a hipster douche. Anyways, welcome back. The trailer for Indiana Jones 5 just dropped, which I can only imagine is going to cover a lengthy apology tour for Indy's various uh, politically incorrect infractions in the 80s. I was a child. I was in love. It was wrong and you knew it. <clears throat> Suffice to say, that got me interested in today's topic, which is this very, very long list on ancient mysteries. The term ancient or antiquity is pretty controversial. Nobody really knows what uh, defines the time period that we consider antiquity, but uh, this list covers the 12,000 BCs all the way to the 1970s. So really, it's anything that I thought was interesting, but not too modern. Starting with the most important antiquity fact of all time, which is that the Egyptians used to worship cats as gods. Why? Because they're the best. Okay, she's in pain. Ah, uh, that was a joke. No. Egyptians did used to worship cats as gods, but I'm not sure if that's the most important antiquity fact of all time. That is probably very scholarly debated. But before we actually do start, an important note. Um, today we're back to the quality of the disturbing Deep Sea Secrets video because I lost my 4K camera. Actually, I rented it from a friend and I gave it back. Not really losing. That sounded really worrying. I would not lose an expensive 4K camera. But uh, the important thing is, the Deep Sea Secrets video was my most popular video by far, so it proves once and for all what I've always thought, that quality isn't worth shit, and content is king. Is king. Let's get education. Starting with our artifacts, pretty self-explanatory ancient artifacts that there may be some sense of uh, mystery about. Really, no need to waste time in this video. There is a lot of time to go around. The Daksha Stone, also called the Map of the Creator, is a stone slab discovered by Russian scientists in 1999. It has creases in it, either naturally formed or artificially carved, according to who you ask, that somewhat resemble a map of Russia's mountainous Ural region. There's not a lot of information on this one. Some people believe that the map was carved into it 3,000 years ago. Some people believe that the rock with its creases formed 120 million years ago. And a very small minority believe the exciting third theory, which is that the rock had the map carved into it 120 million years ago, which of course lends to theories about ancient civilizations existing before some kind of cataclysmic event or a cycle of cataclysmic events that occur periodically, we'll be hearing about a lot of those later. Also, possibly aliens. The London Hammer is an iron and wood hammer that was excavated in 1936 in London, Texas. What's interesting is that it was found to be encased in lower Cretaceous rock, which some people have dated to be around millions of years old. This again has been used to support theories about ancient civilizations existing in a pre-flood time, or one predating some kind of cataclysm like the Younger Dryas, and also, again, theories that it was cre created by aliens. Judicola Rock is a rock that is located in Jackson County, North Carolina, famous for its unusual petroglyphs, or rock carvings, that have yet to be decoded, written in some kind of secret language or code. It's believed to be as old as the year 200 AD. Pakal's spaceship. Ah. Pakal's spaceship is literally an ancient spaceship that was discovered in the Mayan capital of Mayapan that definitively proves that aliens are real and visited us in the past. Just kidding, but close. The sarcophagus of the Mayan king Pakal was excavated in 1952. The coffin's lid features this intricate design, which some people believe depicts the late king operating some kind of spacecraft. Another interesting thing about Pakal is that the Mayans noted him dying at around 80 years old in their records, while scientific analysis of his body showed him to be in his 40s. This has led to some theories that Pakal may have been some, some kind of time traveler. The Klerksdorp spheres are small circular objects that were discovered in Adasdal, South Africa. Like the Daksha stone and London hammer, they were found in incredibly old conditions, this time being extracted from 3 billion year old Pyrophyllite? Phyllite? Some kind of mineral or crystal. 
This, of course, has lent the theories about ancient civilizations, aliens, etc., etc. However, scientists have officially made their claim that the objects are naturally formed. Still pretty weird looking, though, so that one's up to you. The Dighton Rock, like the Judicola Rock, is an American rock with several unusual petroglyphs carved into it that have yet to be deciphered. The Antikythera Mechanism. The Antikythera Mechanism is an ancient Greek device recovered from a shipwreck in 1901. Although its exact purpose is unknown, it's suspected to have been used for astronomy and is the oldest known example of an analog computer. It's also a shocking discovery because similar advanced technology wouldn't appear again until the 1300s with the Antikythera mechanism being, being as old as 100 BC. The Baghdad Battery, or Bag Baghdad, my Baghdad, <laughs> kill me, was an artifact excavated in Iraq in 1936 that was dated to originate anywhere from the year 150 BC to the year 200 AD. And I want to note here that uh, I know we have a different term for referring to years after the calendar year zero now, but I always grew up with AD, so that's how I'm going to be referring to it throughout the video. It was made up of a ceramic pot with a tube of copper and an iron rod stuck through the middle. In modern recreations, it's been proven that this little copper chamber with the iron rod in the middle could produce a minimal amount of voltage if filled with an electrolytic liquid or a liquid that conducts electricity, which is where it gets its battery name from. But most archaeologists believe that it was used for something immensely boring, like storing scrolls. The Phaistos disc is a clay artifact found in 1908 in a Minoan palace on the island of Crete, Greece. It has captured people's imaginations for the last century as inscribed on its surface are a strange set of symbols and words written in yet again another undecipherable language or code. Many people have tried and failed to decipher it, and it's unlikely that anybody will succeed unless more examples of this code or language are unearthed. The Shroud of Turin is a linen shroud which, if you look closely, appears to have the face of Jesus Christ displayed on it. The face is much more easily seen when you apply a negative effect to the shroud, which is creepy enough, but what's even creepier is that not even scientists can tell what method was used to get the face drawn into the shroud. There's a popular theory that Jesus wore it himself when he was buried, but most believe that it was created around the year 1300, and it's been kept in Italy's Cathedral of Turin since, since the late 1500s. The dodecahedron is any 12-sided shape, but in this context, it's being used to refer to an ancient Roman object made of copper, which also has 12 sides. Nobody's been able to figure out what they were used for, some theories being that they were used to hold coins or in, in religious ceremonies. The Piri Ray map was compiled by Ottoman Admiral Piri Ray in 1513. What's mysterious about this map is that it includes detailed drawings of North and South America, which the Ottomans should have had no way of knowing about. Only a small fragment of the map has been uncovered, but what's most shocking is that a little continental tip at the bottom has been suggested to depict that they even had knowledge of Antarctica. Well, speaking of Indy, the Ark of the Covenant is one of the most coveted artifacts of all time. It was a golden chest which was said to contain the Ten Commandments original stone tablets, a wand imbued with magical powers, and a pot of pure unfiltered mana or magical energy. The Book of Exodus describes the Ark being built by Moses under direct instruction from God at the peak of Mount Sinai to house the Ten Commandments. Although it's not proven to exist, there have been accounts of increased real-life religious activity whenever the Ark was described as being moved and stolen in biblical text, and today it's heavily rumored to be kept under guard in the Orthodox Toweto Church in Ethiopia. The Voynich Manuscript is a 240-page illustrated codex, which is just a book using any material predating printed paper, created in the early 1400s that's written in a cryptid language that Yet again, has yet to be decoded. The contents of the codex are extremely interesting, with many of its pages depicting fantastical plants, unknown planets and astrological symbols, and strange people piloting bizarre mechanisms. And its creator and place of origin have yet to be discovered. Oh boy. The Spear of Destiny, Holy Lance, or Lance of Longinus, is the spear that was allegedly used by the Roman centurion Longinus to pierce Christ during his crucifixion. Since then, it's had an extremely flavored history, with multiple parties allegedly seeking it out, although keep in mind, the story that I'm about to tell is extremely unfounded fringe history, but an entertaining story at that. 
Charlemagne, the first Holy Roman Emperor, carried the spear into battle with him and considered it to be a lucky charm. He reportedly later died after dropping it from his horse during battle. Since then, the spear has become associated with victory among history's various conquerors. At one point, there was even a trade proposed between two kings, where one of the kings offered to give up half of his country for the spear. Napoleon also tried to track it down, but failed. Then, in the early 1900s, it found its way to a museum in Vienna, where it was seen by a young Austrian veteran of World War I, Adolf Hitler. Hitler became obsessed with the spear, and his first order of business when annexing Austria in 1938 was to retrieve it from that same museum in Vienna. From that point onward, it became one of his personal keepsakes until it was retrieved by the Allies in 1944, and Hitler killed himself in his bunker. From then on, it fell into the hands of General George S. Patton of the United States until he lost it and died in a car crash one year later. Since then, it's returned to the same museum in Vienna if you want to try to get your hands on it, but I wouldn't recommend it given the track record of those who have. The shaft of the spear has been gone for a long time with only a head remaining, and apparently, after some renovations, it's bound by the nails of the true cross the cross that Christ was crucified on. The Codex Gigas, or Devil's Bible, is a manuscript that was written in the early 1200s. It's infamous for its bizarre full-page drawing of the devil, also for being the largest illustrated manuscript from the time period. It's unknown who wrote the Codex, but why find out when we have this excellent theory about why it was created, telling us that it was written by a monk who broke his vows as his last chance to stop himself from being executed. According to the myth, the monk was imprisoned and told to make the Bible in just one night to atone for his sins. And upon realizing this was an impossible task, he made a deal with the devil who wrote it in his place. Modern inspection of the thing has determined that it would take around 20 years to recreate just the text portions of the codex, and we can probably assume that the intricate illustrations and ornate page flourishes would take at least half that long. So whoever did make it must have had a real good reason for doing so. And in our section on artifacts, we have the Sumerian King's List, which is an incomplete collection of clay tablets that have been found across what was once Mesopotamia. It contains lists and histories of various Sumerian kings and details their reigns. It's been cited in some supernatural circles due to the fact that along with references to real historical kings and events, it also contains references to supposedly fictional individuals like Gilgamesh, much more on him later, and opens with a description of a kingdom falling from the sky after a worldwide flood, which you can imagine gets all kinds of people excited, and I cannot wait until this incomplete collection of clay tablets becomes complete. Can't help but wonder what else is on there. I had to take a quick break. The cat tore down the green screen, but moving on to part two, places. This is again, pretty self-explanatory. Um, archeological dig sites that have some historical significance or ancient monuments that still mystify us today. Okay, starting with Stonehenge. Stonehenge is a monument that sits on the Salisbury Plain in England. It's composed of 25-ton vertical stones topped with even heavier horizontal stones and was built as early as 3000 BC, which is, needless to say, an unbelievable feat of architecture. Given this, several theories have popped up and come forward as to how and why Stonehenge was created. Theory 1, the earliest theory on Stonehenge, was that Merlin built it under orders from King Arthur's uncle Aurelius Ambrosius around the 5th century to commemorate the death of the then ruling Celtic British nobles who were killed by invading Saxons. This theory was of course come up with when Merlin and Aurelius Ambrosius and King Arthur were considered historical fact. Some people claim it was built in Ireland and then Merlin used his magical powers to move it into England. Theory number 2. An architect named Inigo Jones analyzed Stonehenge under the instructions of King James I and deduced that it was laid out in the Roman style of architecture. Romans had previously conquered parts of England before the Saxons arrived, but unfortunately this theory contradicts the theory that it was built by Merlin and the Celtic Britons with magic powers. Jones was unable to offer a reason as to why the Romans would have built Stonehenge because before he could publish his writings on the site, he died. Theory number three. Years later, a physician named Dr. Walter Charlton proposed that Stonehenge was built in the 9th century by the Norse, who were present in much of England at that time. 
He believed that Stonehenge's shape was meant to represent a crown and that coronation rituals took place there for Danish kings. And then there are all the assorted theories like uh, the hyper-advanced ancient civilization, of course, aliens, and British druids, which is an interesting one. But the overall point is to this day, we still have no idea who built Stonehenge or why they built it, and even to some degree how it was built, which is why it remains strong as one of the most mysterious monuments in our history. Gobekli Tepe is an ancient city located in Mesopotamia. It predates Stonehenge by thousands of years, being just under 12,000 years old. What's most shocking about Gobekli Tepe is that archaeologists at the dig site say that 95% of it is still underground, so we're probably looking at the largest prehistoric site in history by far. Possibly the first temple in history, carvings show remnants of some kind of ancient religion with elements of animal spirit worship. The man who discovered Gobekli Tepe, archaeologist Klaus Schmidt, believes that it was built by surrounding hunter-gatherer groups to serve as some kind of central sanctuary. He has also hypothesized that it was purposefully buried, which just raises so many questions. Its geometric alignment, influenced in part by astronomy, far exceeds anything we've previously thought hunter-gatherer groups around that time were capable of, which has, of course, lent to hyper-advanced civilization, alien theories, blah, 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 blah. El Dorado, the legendary city of gold, or in some versions, collection of seven cities, still of gold, is a myth that inspired several expeditions by various captains and conquistadors throughout the 15 and 1600s. El Dorado was mostly believed to have been located in South America, but there were a couple of explorers who scoured Central and Lower North America for it as well. It has yet to be discovered, unfortunately. The Laos Plain of Jars is a megalithic structure, or structure made of large stones like Stonehenge and Gobekli Tepe in Laos. Figure that. Archaeologists have determined that the jars were placed there between 1200 and 600 BC in burial rituals, but why believe something so morbid when we have Laos' own legend which describes the jars as being used by a race of giants and their king named Kun Chueng to brew liquor in celebration of victory against enemies in battle? The Nazca Lines are a group of giant geoglyphs in the Nazca Desert in Peru. They were created over a period of 900 years between 400 BC and 500 AD through the painstaking process of making incisions in the desert floor and filling them with different colored dirt until a detailed figure up to a half a mile long was created. The real mystery is why the Nazca people made them. Some believe that it was a signal to some skybound deities that they believed in, while others believed them to be simple trail markers. It's been observed that the lines converge on the horizon during the winter solstice, so there may have been an astronomical purpose for them as well. Around 90 of these figures have been discovered using drone technology, and many archaeologists believe that there are even more out there. Easter Island is a Chilean island that's become famous for its almost 1,000 Moai statues, also known as the Easter Island Heads. These megalithic structures were carved by invading Polynesians between 1200 and 1500 in the likeness of their deceased ancestors, and it was believed that the larger the statue was, the more mana it would generate in memory of the dead. Like Stonehenge and Gobekli Tepe, the carving and transportation of such massive stones is incredibly impressive. The Easter Island heads are very cool and uh, mystical, but they aren't the only mystery that the Easter Island houses. There are also the Rongo Rongo glyphs that were discovered on stone tablets there. The glyphs are written in a language called Rongo Rongo that has yet to be deciphered, and it may be one of the only languages in the world created completely independently of any other linguistic influences. Newgrange is an Irish monument, a tomb built overlooking Ireland's River Boyne in 5200 BC, making it older than Stonehenge and the Great Pyramids of Giza. It's an incredibly technically impressive feat for that time period, and what makes it even cooler is that every winter solstice, the sun creates a beam into the tomb's inner chamber, which illuminates the ancient carving on its walls. So again, we see not just incredible architectural prowess in prehistory, but also an immense knowledge of astronomy, and also a welcome return from the winter solstice. Machu Picchu is a citadel located in Peru that was built in the 1600s by the Incas. What baffles people about this one is that the granite stones used to build the site would have had to have been carried up the Andres Mountain the site sits on. Keep in mind, the Incas had not yet invented the wheel, so how they accomplished this is just up to archaeologists' imagination at this point. Also, 
The stones are carved and aligned together so precisely that no cracks are present in its architecture, which is another incredibly impressive feat. Astronomy was heavily important in Machu Picchu's construction as well, as during the fall and spring equinoxes, the sun rises directly above the monument, producing absolutely no shadows within it. Mount Arara, Arara is a dormant volcano in Turkey. The Book of Genesis names the mountains of Arara, quote unquote, as the place where Noah's Ark came to a rest after the Great Flood, which many associate with this location. There's also an anomaly towards the summit of the mountain that the Defense Intelligence Agency has called a linear facade in the glacial ice underlying more recently accumulated ice and snow, which many believe could be the remains of the Great Ark. The Asun Sacred Grove is located in a dense forest in Osogbo, Nigeria. The grove contains both renovated modern sections created by artists and older sacred idols created by the Yoruba, a group of people who use the grove to worship the fertility goddess Asun. What's interesting is that within the grove, over 200 plants can be found with medicinal uses, which makes the presence of an earth goddess seem all the more likely. The Yoruba have said that such groves used to be common in each of their towns, and this is the last one left. The hypogeum of Hal Sefliani is uh, actually not Italian, is it? It's in Malta. Is Malta in Italy? No, Malta is its own country. <laughs> How ignorant of you. So the Hypogeum of Hal Safliani is an underground cemetery built in 3000 BC in Malta, a very distinguished and uh, solitary country of its own origin. It's impressive as once again we have a main chamber called the Holy of Holies which becomes fully illuminated during the winter solstice. There's also another chamber called the Oracle Room which is designed to amplify resonance making your voice echo several times louder than usual. Puma Punku is a site in Bolivia. There are several 100-ton megalithic stone structures here that are carved in H shapes with perfect right angles. We see here the recurring mystery of advanced stone carving capabilities that archaeologists have yet to fully unravel. And like Machu Picchu, the site is at a very high elevation, so the Aymara people who built it would have had to lug the stones up several thousand feet. That and their strange alignment, somewhat resembling kind of like a track, have led to theories that Pumapunku was used as a landing base for aliens. But if the aliens were capable of interstellar travel, I'm not so sure that their landing base would be built out of granite stones. The Sajama lines are a network of thousands of perfectly straight lines, also in Bolivia, etched around the Sajama volcano. Altogether, the lines that have been discovered measuring at three times the length of the entire United States, and for that reason, they could be considered the largest artwork in history. They were created over 3,000 years ago, for what reason and who exactly it was that made them are still unclear, but perhaps there was an alien landing base in the Sajama volcano? You know, when I wrote this list, I um, kind of didn't take into consideration how hard some of these things would be to pronounce. And because they're such obscure topics, some of them don't have pronunciations available online. This is one of them. Here we go. Envitenet, Envitenet, well, Tenet makes sense, I guess. Envitenet Island sits on Rudolph Lake in Kenya. It has a hollow center, kind of like Sutopolis City from Pokemon Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald and is believed to be cursed by many Kenyans who live around it. No one dares to go near it, which makes what's inside its mountainous walls completely baffling and unsettling. Yes, there are abandoned settlements, first spoken of in Kenyan folklore, then confirmed through photograph. Who lived there, why they chose this extremely unconventional spot, and how they got past the island's steep sides and into the center of it remains a my mystery to this day. Lake Titicaca, between Peru and again Bolivia has become infamous in alien and Atlantis enthusiast circles as there appears to be the ruins of a 1,000 year old temple sunken into it. The fact that it's the highest lake in the world at a 12,000 foot altitude also generates theories of it being man-made and various legends referring to it being a palace of dwelling for spirits and gods and alleged sightings of something flying out of the lake at night have made it a certified UFO hotspot. Gilgamesh's tomb is the alleged real-life resting place of the alleged real-life Sumerian king and historical figure Gilgamesh, but don't worry, we'll be getting back to both of these later. And here we go with the least 
ancient mystery on the list, the Faces of Belmez having started in 1971. These strange face-like figures started appearing on the floor of the Pereira family's household in Belmez, Spain. Since then, different faces have been appearing and disappearing regularly in the house, and although several scientific studies have been conducted, an explanation for the phenomenon has yet to be offered. Great Zimbabwe is a site built around 800 years ago in Zimbabwe. Real shocker there, I know. Experts have hypothesized that the ruins used to be a palace for a local monarch. However, there is some dispute about this as the central tower has zero windows or doors, and I can't imagine that that would make any royal happy. The architects haven't been conclusively decided, but it is believed that the place was built by the Shona people. Shin Ao Av, like El Dorado, is a legendary city. It's said to be 5,000 years old and deep beneath the ground in California, with an entrance at the base of Death Valley. The only account of Shin Ao Av comes from a man named Howard E. Hill, who gave a speech in 1947 telling the story of a friend who found a cave system beneath the Death Valley with glyphs carved into the walls and the mummified remains of people who were nine feet tall. And the Land of Nod, which is a location in the Bible, it's actually where Cain flees to after unaliving Abel. I'm just not sure about YouTube's content moderation rules these days. It seems like people have been limiting their use of shocking vocabulary. Anyways, the word Nod in the name leads some people to believe that it's an illusion to sleep or some kind of world of dreams and nightmares as there's very little description given of the place and I only think it's mentioned the once which is when Cain flees to it in Genesis. I don't think there's any other mentions of the land of Nod in the Bible besides that. Onwards we go to part three. People. This is mysterious people in history and antiquity. Starting with Xin Shi Huang, who was the first emperor of unified China and a strict legalist who was not the nicest guy, as a lot of legalists were known to be. He ruled between 221 and 210 BC and founded the Xin dynasty. And uh, he's been a history hotspot for a while because not only was he absolutely obsessed with immortality, in fact, it was his primary goal, but he was also laid to rest at that tomb at the foot of the Lishan Mountains that's filled with those clay soldiers that have been featured in probably a dozen B sci-fi movies plots by now. But what's most interesting about Shen Shi Huang is his obsession with dragons. That was probably the thing he was most obsessed with besides immortality. He often depicted himself as a dragon and was said to have an intense alignment with the element of water. And uh, some myths claim that Xin Shi Huang arrived in China on a dragon's back and his skin was blue, which of course has UFOologists going absolutely crazy. But Zoroaster, aka Zarathustra, or the mysterious man, is the founder of Zoroastrianism. And by God, if he had just not named it after himself like a douche, it would be so much less of a mouthful and perhaps one of today's major world religions. Anyways, uh, Zoroastrianism is potentially the oldest monotheistic religion in history, which is a religion where you worship a single god rather than a pantheon of several gods, like Hinduism. Uh, Zoroastrianism went on to influence today's Abrahamic faiths, so the argument could be made that Zoroaster is one of the most influential people in history. So, like Jesus and Buddha, other founders of major influential religions, what do we know about Zoroaster? Absolutely nothing. As mysterious as it is, the only thing we know about Zoroaster is that at some point he founded Zoroastrianism in Iran. We don't even know when it was or where he lived, where he came from. We don't know anything about him. I guess that's why they call him the mysterious man. Gil Perez was an imperial Spanish soldier who, according to legend, showed up in Mexico City on October 25th, 1593 in a uniform that was standard issue for soldiers stationed in the Philippines. Mexican soldiers found him passed out and in an incorrect uniform and began to question him. Perez told them that he had been on guard outside the governor's palace in the Philippines the previous night on the 24th, where the current governor Gomez had just been assassinated, and after falling asleep, he just woke up here. 
The Mexican soldiers jailed him, believing him to be a deserter, insane, or involved in witchcraft. However, he was released just a month later when news of the assassination of Governor Gomez of the Philippines finally reached Mexican soil. The Green Children of Woolpit. Well, here come the actual aliens. So these were two siblings who showed up in Suffolk, England in the mid 1100s during the reign of King Stephen. The two were said to have a nasty attitude and ate a diet consisting only of beans. But besides that, they appeared completely normal for children their age, except for their entirely green skin. What? Ah, this is allegedly true. When they were first found, the sibling's skin pigment was dark green. However, when their new caretakers got them on a normal diet, their skin started to change to a regular color, but the brother died soon after. And as for the sister, when she began getting accustomed to her new surroundings, she started telling stories of her homeland, which according to her was called St. Martin's Land, where everything was green, the sun never rose, and the world lay in an eternal twilight. Oh yeah, baby, it's Gilgamesh. It's the oldie goldie, it's the original hero, the semi-demigod, the king of Uruk, who is somehow apparently two-thirds god and one-third human, which no idea how the math there checks out. I mean, I guess if one parent was a god and the other parent was a demigod, but then Gilgamesh would be three quarters god and one quarter human. So I, it just goes too far up the family tree to figure out, I guess. Anyways, the Epic of Gilgamesh is the oldest story that we have permanent record of being written on 12 stone tablets in ancient Mesopotamia. In it, Gilgamesh starts out as an arrogant king, but through a beautiful friendship with a man made out of clay and sent by the gods to temper him named Enkidu, he reforms. After Enkidu's death, he goes on a long journey seeking immortality, finding it in the form of the Flower of Life, which is unfortunately eaten by one of those god darn snakes before Gilgamesh can get his hands on it. It's always those snakes in these stories. Although he mourns initially, in the end the whole experience teaches him to accept his mortality and enjoy life. Gilgamesh is definitely one of the most influential characters in fictional history, but therein lies the question, was he fictional? We talked about the King's List earlier, which some believe contains evidence that he was not fictional, and some historians actually agree with that. However, a down-to-earth interpretation of him as a real-life Sumerian king who just embellished his own life through the story of the Epic of Gilgamesh is incredibly boring. Where is the evidence that the events of the story actually took place and that Gilgamesh was an alien king descended from the heavens? Well, we'll be getting to some of that later. William Shakespeare is one of the most famous writers in the world. A Glover's son born in Stratford-upon-Avon who rose through the ranks of English society with his incredible storytelling abilities before eventually being rewarded a royal patent and becoming a hack who wrote pro-Tudor war propaganda. But the question is, was William Shakespeare William Shakespeare? Yes, there is a storied and ongoing scholarly debate over the true identity of the bard, with some people claiming that the basic level of education William Shakespeare supposedly received would have made his linguistic prowess impossible. Others don't think that a William Shakespeare existed at all. Ramanujan was a famous Indian mathematician whose life spanned right between the late 1800s and early 1900s. Although he had barely any formal training in the field of mathematics, he's remembered as one of the most influential people in the history of STEM, having contributed a wide variety of equations and formulas to the field, most of which were completely novel. What's so intriguing about him is his method. He claimed that many of his discoveries were given to him in his dreams by gods, particularly incarnations of Vishnu from his native religion of Hinduism. Mound builders is a term that refers to numerous groups of people who lived in what is now considered the midlands of the United States as early as 3000 BC. They get their name from the earthwork mounds they constructed, many in the shape of flat top pyramids or in effigies of what are assumed to be religious figures like massive serpents. Due to the massive territory mound building cultures spanned, as well as the large time period they built these structures during, the exact purpose of the earthworks, as well as the details about the mound builders' daily lives, remain largely unknown. The Man from Tored is an infamous story. Its verifiability, that's a word, truthfulness, I guess, 
is dubious, but uh, it's been circulated for so long that I figured it's earned a spot on the list. The story goes like this. In July 1954, a man arrives at Tokyo Airport in Japan. He's Caucasian looking and wears average clothing, but when his documents are inspected before boarding, his flight officials notice that his passport states that he's from the country of Tored. The officials asked him to point out where Tored is on a world map, and he becomes agitated when he realizes that where he thought his home country was is actually Andorra in Europe, which, like Malta, is another very uh, distinguished country with a rich history. Even so, the man was carrying currency from several European countries, and his passport had stamps from all over the world, including previous visits to the Tokyo airport, so the officials escalated the matter to police, who took him to a hotel. When he was interrogated, the man became agitated again and claimed that Tored is an esteemed European country with a thousand years of history to its name. All the people the man had come to Tokyo to supposedly get in contact with had never heard of him. Thoroughly confused, the police left the man in the hotel room with two guards outside the doors. When they returned, he vanished. The room was completely empty and several stories up the building, so there was no way he could have gone off the balcony. Where did he go? Some think he originated from a parallel dimension where Tourette was a respected member of the UN, and after his accidental trip to our dimension, he blissfully returned to his own. But see, the Iceman, who if you've never heard of, you didn't have a childhood, is a mummy discovered in the Austrian Alps who's been dated to have lived sometime around 3200 BC. What we've been able to discern from things like his hair follicles and the contents of his stomach are frankly an amazing show of modern forensic, but let's be honest, that stuff is all boring, and what's really interesting about Utzi is, of course, how he died. Reanalysis of Utzi's body has found an arrowhead lodged in his left shoulder and several bruises indicative of blunt force trauma, meaning Utzi didn't just die. He was murdered. Although there will definitely be enough evidence to piece Although although there will never although we'll never have enough evidence to definitively piece together what happened to Utzi that day on the Austrian Alps, it still stands as the first cold case in history. So we're now going into our final section, which is concepts. Um, I don't really know how to explain this one. I mean, I think people can kind of just get it from their gut. It's things that don't fall into any of the other three sections. That's, uh, that's the best way to put it. So, pyramids. The focal point for theories and stories of all different kinds and flavors. We find these structures all over the world. I mean, the Great Pyramids of Giza in Egypt, the Pyramids of the Moon and Sun in Chichen Itza in Mexico, the pyramids of Argolis in Greece, the aforementioned flat top mound builder pyramids, and if you listen to those kinds of podcasts, the pyramids in the Antarctic and Amazon, uh, which remain unproven. So what's up with all these cultures, which for the most part would have had no contact with each other, building such similar structures? Well, modern archaeologists would tell you that these people were just imitating nature, and that they were building triangles because they're the most stable shape which goes along with their other numerous mathematical and astronomical discoveries, but that explanation is boring as shit. So what would our truth seekers say? Well, just focusing on the Pyramid of Giza, since they're the most famous example, there are people who believe that it isn't just a burial monument, but also a power plant of some kind. With evidence of water erosion in its chambers, the hypothesis is that the water was made to channel through its interior, creating kind of hydraulic energy, a design that ancient astronaut theorists believe was based off of natural volcanoes. There's also the fact that the Great Pyramids have the closest alignment to the true north of any building in the world, as well as having a precisely flat base and a generally an incredibly impressive and almost unbelievable level of mastery in their overall architecture that some modern architects have said would require laser cutting technology to build today. Plus, there are a bunch of other oddities, like the pillars above its inner king's chamber having several 70-ton pillars brought from hundreds of miles away and raised over 300 feet to be fitted into the structure, and the fact that 
and this is true, the latitude of the pyramid's peak is exactly 29.9792458 degrees north, a number which unbelievably is exactly equal to the speed of light in meters per second. So what's up with the crazy detail that went into the pyramids? UFOologists believe that if it did function as a power plant, then it was some kind of landing base, beacon, or portal for incoming and outgoing alien species. But there is another theory which gives more credit to our ancestors, devised by a man who was destined to be mentioned at some point in this video, and that is Graham Hancock, who, let's be clear, is an author, not an archaeologist, but is way too entertaining not to cover. Hancock believes that similar structures like pyramids, as well as other things like similarities and stories that we'll be talking about later, are due not to alien technology or invasion, but a globe-spanning civilization that shared influence over the entire planet in the past. He's often received a lot of criticism for this, understandably, such as the fact that we don't have any remnants or tools or technology from these seafarers. He claims that it was a seafaring civilization that had the same uh, or roughly the same span, scope, and range as the British Empire, which is quite the claim. However, Hancock revokes all of the arguments about his lack of evidence with the greatest claim of all time, which is magic. Well not really technically magic, his assertion is that they didn't technologically evolve in the same way we did, instead relying more on possible psychic abilities as well as the very fringe scientific theories of frequency and sound manipulation of matter. And people like Hancock believe that as molecules and atoms are constantly vibrating, that sound and frequency shifts can be used to manipulate matter, like causing the molecules of air under a stone pillar to move in the same direction and induce levitation and carry it for hundreds of miles, hypothetically. They also, according to Hancock, these ancient uh, people of this great world-spanning civilization would have been more shamanistic, using psychedelics and advanced meditation to reach other dimensions. This ancient mysterious super-civilization and its mystical abilities, according to Hancock, were unfortunately wiped out by the effects of the Younger Dryas, which we talked about an episode ago, but there are traces of it left above and below the ocean, like Japan's Yonaguni Monument, which has pyramid qualities of its own, which we talked about an episode ago in the Disturbing Deep Sea Secrets episode, and the Eye of the Sahara in Atlantis, which we also talked about in the Deep Sea Secret episode an episode ago. It was a great episode. The Fountain of Youth is a classic legend, a mythical fountain whose waters would reverse the effects of aging or add more years to your lifespan, depending on the interpretation you're reading or watching. I got the second one from Pirates of the Caribbean, if you couldn't tell. Uh, many people quested for it, but its most famous supposed location was actually in Bimini, where the Bimini Road is located, which we also talked about an episode ago in the Disturbing Deep Sea Secrets episode. Wow, it's kind of starting to look like everything actually is connected. Uh, these days, the Fountain of Youth has become a more popular term for futurists describing a hypothetical end to aging through advanced biochemistry, or an already pre-discovered end to aging discovered by a certain past super-ancient secret civilization and or aliens. This one is not as inherently entertaining as some of the other ones, but apparently in Greece there are temple lines along which holy sites lie apart from each other equidistantly, at the same distance one after the other. Delphi lies at the center, causing some to believe that portions of Greece were planned and constructed on a geometric nexus. There's a similar nexus of lines spanning across Europe and all meeting in the former Druid holy site of Aleis, which has spurned similar theories. The Hopi petroglyphs are rock carvings in the American Southwest, estimated to be around a thousand years old. The carvings supposedly depict a thousand years of the Hopi people's history, and a few of them have been interpreted as depicting UFOs and extraterrestrial visitors. The crystal skulls are objects that were reportedly unearthed around the Americas. These artifacts are said to have been crafted before the 1400s out of quartz. Many have pointed out that it would have been impossible to carve them without leaving some kind of crack or mark that would give us a clue exactly how they were made but nothing like that has ever been found on them. 
Scientists who have looked at the skulls have decidedly said that they were made as a hoax in Germany in the 1900s, but there are still believers in the earlier creation date, and several interesting rumors around the skull, like the fact that, allegedly, some members of the Navajo claim one of them was given to them by star children. Ah, the Late Bronze Age Collapse was a period of widespread societal collapse that affected the Mediterranean so badly it ushered in a Dark Age with Greece. According to historian Robert Drews, within a period of 40 to 50 years at the end of the 13th and beginning of the 12th century, almost every significant city in the Eastern Mediterranean world was destroyed, many of them never to be occupied again. So what was responsible for this devastating event? To this day, no one knows. It's believed that the event roughly corresponds to the end of the real-world conflict the Trojan War was based on, but beyond that, historians have no clue, with several compounding factors like droughts, diseases, volcanoes, and the such being proposed as theories. The idea of an invasion by quote-unquote Sea people is also floated, with these sea people being a historical concept of a seafaring group that also had conflicts with ancient Egypt. And of course, who can help but think of Graham Hancock's theory of the super hyper ancient advanced ancient super advanced psychic magic civilization when hearing this. A hundred or so years after the late Bronze Age collapse, ironworking became more prevalent, thankfully ushering in the Iron Age. Here we go. This is the one everybody has been waiting for. So there exists a very, 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 very fringe theory that the Iraq war was not what it appeared to be on the surface, and the American invasion of Iraq was actually a cover for American intelligence agencies to become involved in a secret shadow war to recover the remains of Gilgamesh. And the decision of one man to launch a wholly unjustified and brutal invasion of Iraq, I mean of Ukraine. His DNA apparently contains the aforementioned Fountain of Youth, which is very interesting because the entire point of the Epic of Gilgamesh is that he doesn't become immortal at the end. But uh, I have a feeling whoever put this theory together is not too detail-oriented. They were also after the trove of ancient tech that his tomb would inevitably hold. According to the story, the Iraq War started only one month after the potential site of Gilgamesh's tomb was found in the region, and somewhat related is an armed conflict Marines supposedly had earlier with an entity known as the Giant of Kandahar, a sort of biblical cryptid, in Afghanistan in 2002, with Gilgamesh being 18 feet tall according to some myths. I guess this battle clued the United States into Gilgamesh and his crew popping up again in the Middle East, but needless to say, this all remains very, very unfounded. And uh, surprisingly, I did not make this up. This is actually a real theory that some people believe. Uh, thankfully, moving on from that, we have Nephilim, demigods, and giants, and I placed them all together because they are somewhat related. Also, coincidentally enough, related to what we just talked about. So for those unaware, Nephilim are giants mentioned in the Bible that are the children of a human and an angel, or in some interpretations, a fallen angel or demon. Uh, similarly, we have Gilgamesh, who was a demigod, but also described in some tales as a giant. So. There is this relationship between giants and divine, or in modern retellings, alien DNA. If giants were real, I guess this could be one explanation for them. Another theory proposes that uh, there was more oxygen in the atmosphere before the events of the Younger Dryas, or the Flood, if you're a creationist, which caused species to be larger, uh, humans included, and we do see examples of uh, species in prehistoric eras that are much larger than they are today, so maybe so. So there is a very interesting theory that suggests that the characteristics describing Yahweh, or the Abrahamic God of the Old Testament, could be interpreted as also describing a dragon. The YouTuber Mr. Mythos made a pretty in-depth video on this topic, and I suggest you check it out. It's very, very good and very fun to watch. But basically, there are certain sections of the text that describe him as having a long face with nostrils that flare up when enraged, 
breathing fire, flying, and protecting others with long wings, and a general theme of serpent symbolism in Yahweh's effigies, and some descriptions of the angelic seraphim. Yahweh is also described as being carried around on a giant tent called a tabernacle and having an affinity for gold, so to some, the shoe definitely fits. Dragons are a symbol that have appeared in pretty much every single culture and religion we can study, so it's not crazy to imagine some undiscovered influences. Although critics point out that the only draconic creatures appearing in Hebrew texts are the aquatic tannin and leviathan and Yahweh's description also incorporates characteristics of other animals. Still, dragons can also sometimes be seen sporting characteristics of multiple animals and are seen by some as embodiments of all the natural threats humanity faced in their early days on the planet, so you be the judge of that one. Gnosticism is a collection of beliefs from scholars of the Abrahamic faiths that's uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The basic idea is that the patriarchal and monotheistic god of these religions, known as Yahweh, Allah, or Father, is actually an evil figure who created the physical world and trapped humans in it. They call this evil god Yaldabaoth, or the Demiurge, and it rules over reality with its demonic underlings, known as the Archons, who come disguised as angels. It's interesting to note two things about Gnosticism. One, that it's historically become prevalent in time periods where long-standing societal structures are questioned, including the modern day. And two, it's strikingly similar to Buddhism, where the physical world and all of its material pleasures are ruled over by Mara, a dark god similar to Yaldabaoth. Also, the era before the physical world is created, where humans lived in eternal bliss, reminds me of the Golden Age in Greek mythology, where immortal humans were described as living in a paradise, which I guess is also kind of like the Garden of Eden, so it turns out this stuff is all really connected. When we look at the Old Testament God and even equivalent sky fathers in other religions like Zeus, we do see a trend of, uh, shall we say, politically incorrect behavior. And Gnosticism is a pretty metal belief system, but what makes it even more metal is when we combine it with the previous theory, which is the Abrahamic God being a dragon, and we get the Abrahamic God being an evil dragon, which is completely badass. Agartha, Shambhala, and Zibulba are cities or worlds that in their respective mythologies, that's European, Buddhist, and Mayan, are said to exist underground. This ties into the whole Hollow Earth conspiracy, which claims that the Earth has an interior world, which is filled with any number of fantastical things, from dinosaurs to giant species to alien bases, and several explorers have searched for Agartha, Shambhala, Zibalba, and the Hollow Earth in mountainous regions that supposedly hide their entrance. It's interesting, as in Buddhism, Shambhala isn't originally explicitly underground, but rather a kingdom that exists on both the physical and spiritual planes. And Zibalba similarly isn't always described as underground, with some Mayans claiming that the path to Zibalba exists somewhere in the Milky Way galaxy, so those explorers have probably been looking in the wrong direction. Anunnaki is the term used to refer to the Sumerian pantheon of gods, the oldest gods in recorded history. They were originally depicted as bird-like, but interestingly, in modern times, Anunnaki has become an umbrella term for the supposed ancient aliens that experimented on primates to create humanity and are now often depicted as being reptilian? I've already mentioned it multiple times, but the flood is a recurring theme throughout cultures and history. These days, flood has kind of become a general term for any world reshaping event, especially if it involves the deaths of massive amounts of people. There are some who believe that the original flood myths were influenced by oral traditions from people who survived the Younger Dryas, which actually did cause massive amounts of flooding across the planet. We then talked about that in the Deep Sea Secrets video. Great video. Uh, perhaps these people who survived the Younger Dryas were also survivors of the super hyper ancient shadow advanced civilization. 
There are also very, very, very fringe theorists these days who believe that some kind of flood, this time in the metaphorical sense, is being planned to wipe out a majority of the population, either through a genetically engineered plague or declaring worldwide martial law after a staged alien invasion by the Illuminati. Speaking of, for our last one, we might as well talk about the greatest mystery in history, the Illuminati. Well, I guess with my hands I should do that. In reality, the Illuminati was a group of wealthy intellectuals who since disbanded, who got together in 1776, coincidentally enough, in modern day Germany to discuss enlightenment philosophy and ways to oppose the spread of abusive religious institutions. Oh no! Thanks for watching. Guys, I'm actually coming back at you with one final thing that I discovered while editing that blew my mind. So we talked already a lot in the video about symbols that appear in multiple cultures that may even have been disconnected and had no way of knowing about each other, but these symbols still appear in all of these cultures throughout history. And the main one we talked about, what seemed to be the dominant symbol that was appearing in all cultures, was the symbol of the dragon. Now, here's the crazy part. There is actually an equally old and equally dominant symbol throughout all cultures, and that, of course, is the symbol of the eye. What blew my mind is that historians recently discovered a way in which the dragon and the eye are indisputably connected. This all comes from an ancient text from 12,000 years ago, from 12,000 years ago, 12,000